Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us in this training on licensing e-resources. Um, I, I decided that the title was licensing the basics, and but we're going to specifically talk about e-resources. So I changed it to licensing e-resources just to make it a little bit clearer. Um, as I mentioned already, I'll be recording the webinar. So if you don't have time to stay for the full hour um, or you want to watch it again later or share it with your colleagues, you're very welcome to do that. It will be posted on the IFO YouTube channel. And also there will be a page in the resources section of the IFO website where you can download the slides. Anybody who's attended um, or registered will send an email with the link. So you don't have to worry about taking lots of notes. You will have access to everything later. Um, I will take a, try and take a couple of breaks to look at questions. So while I'm talking, if there are any questions that you have, um, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Evgenia, feel free to interrupt me if, it's, if I've missed a question and it's about something that I've just talked about. Um, that's totally fine. Um, and if not, hopefully there will be some question, time for questions at the end. Okay then, so we've got quite a lot of things to get through. Um, basically, we're going to cover some very basic ground in terms of what are e-resources, what types of e-resources are there, how can you license them, how can you figure out what new resources you might be interested in um, and basically go through the licensing process with you and and i hope it's not going to be too dry and boring <laughs> but we've put in some images to try and uh, make it interesting um, so first of all i wanted to do a very quick introduction um, when we updated these slides, we had a training on this, which was quite a few years old and realized how much has changed in the meantime. I mean, generally now the advantages of e-resources are, are very well known. You see many studies that link the use of e-resources to research success. Um, and you can see as well the advantages over print resources in terms of accessibility, you can search full text, you've got all these amazing things you can do that you can't do with a print resource. And especially also in the context of COVID, where it's a little bit trickier uh, to license out books and put them in quarantine and when the libraries were closed, um, those that had remote access options could provide access to e-resources when they couldn't do that with print books. So I think those advantages are, are quite well known to, to people. Um, now, what's been happening in the last few years specifically for journals is this move towards open access. More, more articles are published in open access. The authors pay to publish rather than the library licenses the content and pays to read. Um, and this has brought along some new models, um, such as read and publish agreements, where you pay to access and pay to publish. And it means that in an ideal future, perhaps for journals and in future also books, you wouldn't need to license content anymore. You would be able to read everything in open access. But I think we're quite a while away from that yet. And also, this only really applies to journals at the moment. So you still have databases and other aggregated content that you'll be licensing um, if, if they find that it's relevant for you. Um, and at the very end of the presentation, we talk a little bit about open access resources um, with some examples if we have time, time to get there. Um, but the first thing, um, again, this is the first thing. The second thing I wanted to talk about is some basic definition because this will probably come up a few times during the presentation. And I find this, uh, people are still confused sometimes about this, but the difference between commercial resources and open access resources. Um, and especially in the context of where some countries might get free access to commercial resources. And this is not the same as open access content. So commercial resources are paywalled content. It means that only authorized users can access them. 
you have to be members of an institution, you have to sign a license, you have to register with the publisher. Usually there's an access fee that is charged um, and there's lots of different business pricing models that we'll talk to in a bit more detail. But also if you get free access to commercial resources, you still have to go through the process. You still have to sign a license agreement. You have to register with the publisher. And it's like a subscription. You still license the content, just that you don't pay. So that's the difference here. Um, and then when it comes to journals, authors can usually publish for free in journals and there's no fees for them, but you always pay, pay to read if it's, if it's paywalled content. And on the other side, you've got open access resources where there is no barriers at all. It's available free of charge to everybody. You don't need to register. You don't need to sign a license. There's usually mostly free copyright. And there's no licensing restrictions. You don't need to register. You don't need to provide your name. You can just click on it and use it. Um, and then on the other side for journals, if you want to publish in those journals, usually there is a charge to publish. For books, it's, it's a different story. Um, so I hope that makes sense, but we've got some illustrations as well. So this is the example for open access resources. Can I get access? You get to the gateway. Sure, you can get access. Everybody's welcome. Come on in, you can access it. There is nothing you need to do. Whereas for commercial resources, if you come in and say, can I get access? And you see some examples there. There's the barrier, the barrier is down and you have to answer these questions. Who are you? Do I know you? Where are you from? Um, and you, if you registered um, with IP access, which we'll talk, talk about later, you are then able to access the resource as well. Um, so that's a brief introduction in terms of the context. So what we'll talk about today is specifically commercial e-resources. Um, and there are a number of different types of commercial e-resources. So you have um, journal collections. So for example, Cambridge University Press get, have their collection of journals, Emerald, Nature, oops, Nature, Sage, you've got different publisher specific collections. And then you also have aggregated journals collection. So this is if the vendor doesn't own the content. So for example, JSTOR, Project News, Hein Online, they aggregate the journals, um, but this is usually journals only. Um, and then you've got eBooks and it's the same. You've got some publisher collections like Oxford Scholarship, Cambridge, and then you've got aggregated collection which contain books from lots of different publishers, also publishers that don't have their own platform, um, like University Press Scholarship Online, you would have um, smaller university presses that you can only access in this way and you can't access directly. And then you've got some databases and again, there's publisher owned collections and then you have aggregated collections. Now the difference between databases and ebooks and journals is that with databases you have different types of content so it's not just journals or not just books but you might have definitions and articles and images and pictures and perhaps video databases is really everything else like different types of different types of content um, so you've got history and video for example um, and you've got some things that cover art where you have more images or dictionary entrances. Um, so it's a little bit broader in terms of journals, books and everything else. I hope, I hope that makes sense so far. If there's any questions, then please, please shout. Um, I'll move on to accessing commercially resources. Um, because this is something we get a lot of questions and if you're new to licensing, it's something quite important that you need to understand. Um, so as I've explained for commercial e-resources, there is this barrier to access that you need to register with the publishers. Um, so to protect the content because it's only available to authorized users, um, you can only get access through some kind of secure mechanism. Um, and this is usually through IP addresses. 
um, IP stands for Internet Protocol. Um, and there's other authentication solutions like Easy Proxy, um, Shibboleth, perhaps you heard of Open Athens, Remote Access, where Eiffel has agreements in place. Um, and in some cases, usernames and passwords are available. But um, these are less secure because if you have give one username and password, people can share them, someone else can access, and there's less control. So publishers tend to tend to avoid tend to avoid that. Um, but the main way that people get access is through IP addresses. Um, and it's something again that people still misunderstand. So the, the IP addresses, they have to be external so you can't have an internal address it has to be static um so the access will only work if addresses it will not work if it's dynamic and to get an external or static ip address universities usually have to apply for it they have to buy the ip address from a provider um to make sure it always stays the same so for example i'm at home and I don't have a fixed IP address because I use personal internet. So if I go to this site where I can check my IP address, um, today my IP address will be different than tomorrow. So then that wouldn't work. If I have a static, it's the same every day. Um, and in some cases, IP addresses cover a whole university, a whole campus. Um, some IP addresses allow access to whole countries if it's gated in a certain way. Um, and this is sometimes also the access to the proxy server. And we should have really added here the link on how you can check. Um, so I maybe add that for the follow up um, presentation um, when I distribute it. Um, so this is an, ex an illustration of how IP addresses work. Um, it's a little bit like a house. So your street is external and it means that your house can be found. Um, and the street, it's likely to be static because um, it rarely changes. It's, you know, you don't move streets, streets don't move about. But if your address changes or if you move house, you need to let people know so they you can get your post delivered, for example, um, and only people that are registered or the only residents of that house are allowed to live in the house and use the service. So we don't want foreigners coming in our house using our, our services because they're not authorized. They don't live here. So it works a little bit in the same way for IP authentication that you don't want people that aren't registered with an institution to come and use your e-resources that you might have paid for. Um, and, and that's why the way it works is that to set up the access, a publisher would enter the IP address in their system, in their access control system. Um, and then if somebody from that institution, from that IP address visits the publisher's website, they recognize them and they let them in. Um, and we've expanded the, the little um little image here can i get access the barrier saying yes i know who you are your ip is registered in my system so please come in um so that's how um how that's how that works really it's a verification based on the ip address and like i said i'll i'll, I'll send a link to a place where you can check your ip address and the way to know if you have a static one is if you check it a few days in a row and if you always get the same answer that's your static IP address. Um, but really, you should use, you should ask your IT um, staff because they would know about it and they would confirm because sometimes you get IP ranges. So although you at your desk in your library, you have one number, it might be different from your colleagues. So you would want to check it at different campuses. But if you ask your IT staff, they would be able to tell you, OK, these are all the numbers that you need to register. So the whole campus can get access and nobody's left out. Um, so I'll pause here for a moment to see if there are any questions um, about this so far. So we might, I can't see anything in the chat um, or the Q and A, no questions, no. We got any questions then please 
shout. If not, I will keep going. Everything's clear. Thank you so much for writing. Thank you. Okay. So then we'll talk a little bit about central negotiation, which um, affects consortia more than individual libraries, um, but I think is important to understand even for individual libraries. So if you're part of a consortium, which I think most of you are, because IFIL works primarily with consortia, you will know that your consortium negotiates um, on behalf of you and, and gets discounted pricing. Um, so discounts is really the important thing. Um, consortium representing a group of libraries, they have greater buying power than an individual library. Um, and it's seen quite an effective channel for members. Um, it's also easier for the publisher if you negotiate on behalf of a consortium rather than individual libraries going for the pub to the publisher. And that's why the publisher will be able to give you additional discounts. So the larger consortium, technically the larger the discount. Um, but on the other hand, there's also time saving for your member libraries. Um, so you would have effectively as on with publishers at consortium level, it would save the libraries a lot of time and money for negotiating prices, arranging free trials, negotiating licenses. So that can be, can be quite beneficial for everybody. Um, and the, the other thing is that you will be able to share and distribute the costs across the consortium. So that means it's equitable access across the member institution. And you'll see, and we'll get to this in a minute, that IFL has negotiated a lot of times its prices by institution, but also consortia wide prices. Um, so if you look at them, having this example in mind, a lot of the times it makes more sense. So for example, the cost of a subscription for a single institution could be $5,000. Um, and if you extend access to another 10 smaller institutions, it might be an extra $1,000. So the total could be 6,000. Let's say it's 6,000 for one, sing one good well-funded institutions and 10 really small poorly funded institutions. And you can then distribute the price across them. So you could say to the poorly funded institutions, you pay $200. So that would be 2000 in total. And the well-funded institutions would pay the rest, which is then 4,000. So they would also save $1,000. And obviously the small institutions wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. But for the publisher as well, they get 11 subscribers. So they are, it's in their best interest to make the prices attractive as a consortium to make it worthwhile for everybody. So that's one example of a cost sharing model, but there's other example for example, um, which could be based on the number of students at each institution. So if you, for example, have your price per consortium, you look at your members and how many students are in each one and you calculate calculate an equivalent price per student and that way each institution would get a price based on how big they are. Um, you could calculate prices for your members based on usage, but that's rarely used nowadays because it really punishes those that have good usage. Um, you could look at your members in terms of what is their ability to pay, annual expenditure for library or library materials or their base payment for journal subscriptions. Um, or you could have an equal share regardless of budget or size, just have the same price for everybody. Um, and then there could be other, other factors you could look at, for example, the proportion of courses taught in English, the speed or the availability of internet, because obviously if some members don't have internet, they can't benefit from accessing the content in the first place. So as a consortium, you, you should really take all these into account. And bear in mind when you look at um, negotiating and, and licensing content. Um, and really, it's quite difficult for consortia to develop a center of expertise because it can be difficult with publishers. if. But if negotiations are centralized, you all come together, you bring your specialized knowledge and expertise gained from dealing with multiple publishers that can build up more quickly. Um, and consortia have access to networks of other consortia and provide quite a good opportunity to share, for example, across the Eiffel 
um, partner countries um, in, if you want to do your own negotiations. And we've also developed this um, guide for consortia staff to help in their own negotiations. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip some of this, but I'll, I'll have the link in the presentation that I'll share with you. And this covers more details for consortia specifically. So it's slightly off topic here, but it's still a licensing related. So I thought it was relevant to mention. So we cover different points um, on how you can negotiate prices with, with consortia. And then in relation to what I mentioned at the start, this new trend of um, pushing towards more open access content um, and having prices that cover publishing as well as reading, um, there's a separate resource that will guide you through how to negotiate those types of agreements, um, access for, that cover access and publishing. And again, this is specifically for, for journals. I won't go into too much detail in this right now, but just to let you know the information is there. Um, and then we'll look in a minute at the Eiffel resources, but basically we've negotiated, you know, free and discounted access to different commercial e-resources with different publishers. Um, and every year we calculate usage and savings statistics that will help our members. So worth having a look at the statistics as well, if that's, if that's of interest. Um, then let's move on to the next kind of right okay now i've understood about um, resources i understand there's different types of resources and how can i identify new resources for licensing um, um although i see there's a question so i'm going to stop briefly namutenia is there new developments in regards to the use of ip addresses during COVID, given the fact that people were mostly working from home and still need to use e-resources through library subscriptions um, yes, so IP addresses are still the way the access gets set up, but what you would get in addition to that is remote access to e-resources from home. So if the library has a VPN connection, for example, or easy proxy um, or any of those services that allow you to register, log into the internet, and then access the content you can access it from home and maybe i'll add when i'll update the slides i'll add some additional information um, on remote access if that's helpful um, and some of the resources that we have that would cover that so that's a good point i probably should have expanded on that um, i still think it's important to understand the basics of the ip address uh, and how it works and and there's lots of different authentication methods. And actually, I think there's some training we've done on remote access specifically um, on how different authentication methods will work. So um, in the follow up, I will also send a link to that. That might be helpful. OK, then, so for identifying new resources, um, there's lots of different e-resources that are available. How do you find what you need and what's available and how can you prioritize and negotiate the pricing and promote awareness? So let's have a little bit quick look. And this is really the overview of the licensing process. Um, so we'll start with assessing institutional needs, identifying resources, and the next step would be requesting pricing, um, quotes and license agreements. You could then arrange a trial. Um, you would need to promote the trial, analyze the usage and user feedback. Is it good? Is it bad? Review the pricing and license agreements and if necessary, negotiate with the publisher. Um, and then you would make your decision on whether you want to go ahead with the licensing or not. Place your order, sign the license agreements, promote the resources and monitor usage on a regular basis. So I'm not sure we'll be able to get through all of this. I'll do my best. Um, but that's really the process that we recommend that you follow. Some people might have a trial first and do the pricing later. I think it's always a good idea to know roughly how much something costs before you try it. So it's not like, oh, this is never going to happen. It's so expensive, for example. Um, and you already have a bit of an idea if it's, if it's affordable or not. So then for assessing institutional and user need, you need to think about what are your institution's priority research areas and what do your users need or want? Also, what do you already provide? 
and what is your budget and do you have appropriate technology in place to support access and use of e-resources so those are all things you might want to think about and you can do some internal analysis first and consult users about the e-resources they would like to have access to you prioritize disciplines and look at those that are considered key strategic areas for your organizations and to do that, you can have face-to-face -face meetings with students and faculty. You could do an online survey. You could ask for feedback via email or social networks. Um, and also analyze requests in view of what you already provide, because there might be, there might be an awareness gap there. Um, so if one starting point might be to look at the IFA website um, for the agreements that we have in place. Um, and that's available on eiffel.net forward slash e-resources where you can do a selection um, by country and you can also select by subject and by type, for example, journals, e-books or databases. Um, and then you click on lots of, you get lots of different um, products, which you can see listed here, for example, Academic Search Premier, STM Compass. And if you click on one of those, you get to this um, product page where you find lots of information about the, the content and the subjects and also links to um, the pricing and licensing page. So this is accessible only to IFL licensing coordinators with a login. So if you're not the IFL licensing coordinator, you should ask the IFL licensing coordinator in your country. And again, um, there's information on our website, everybody's listed. So if you don't know who it is or ask me and I'll, I'll put you in charge, uh, in contact. Um, and then in terms of identifying other resources, uh, yeah, researchers and teachers can also help with those. But if we look at what we did before in terms of the surveys, that would be a good way to do that. So the next step would then be requesting pricing and licensing information. So for the Eiffel resources, um, everything is already negotiated. Um, so we have consortium wide pricing for some resources. Um, and institutional pricing for others. And we also negotiate licensing agreement directly with publishers on behalf of consortium. So everything's already taken care of. So you can talk, like I said, you can contact your licensing coordinator um, or you can contact me and I will put you in contact. Um, then for the non eiffel resources, if you're interested in a resource that's not available via Eiffel, we're still happy to help and advise. Um, but you can, of course, also contact the publishers directly and usually contact information is on their website. Um, recommend that you read the license agreement <laughs> carefully um, because those, if they're not approved through Eiffel, you don't know kind of what's hidden there. So you could um, also compare Pair them to the Eiffel model licenses and I've put a link here sorry that's a horrible looking link <laughs> to the Eiffel model licenses that are available on the website okay before we go to pricing models just checking there's um, no more questions oh there's a chat um, yes Somebody is asking about evidence-based uh, acquisition models. And that's exactly what we'll talk about now. Perfect. Um, so this are, I say pricing models, can also call it business models. Um, so the first one is annual subscription where the content is leased, which means you, you pay to access the content for a year. And then if you stop the subscription, usually you don't have access to anything. Although many journal publishers allow perpetual access to the content published during the subscription period. So, for example, if you subscribe to Cambridge Journals 2020 during 2020, in December 2020, you end the subscription, you will continue to have access to those journals published in that year. But for anything that's databases, ebooks, if you just subscribe for one year, annual subscription, at the end of the subscription, if you don't renew, you don't have access. Um, now purchase works in the way that you buy and you own it in perpetuity. 
So it can be a lot more expensive, but it means you own the content. So it's quite good for um, books that you own, that you know are going to get a lot of use out of. And this is, um, I mean, you can purchase archive rights to journals, but you don't really purchase current journals. So this is more of a books related um, option. And there are in some cases annual access fees. That means um, you pay to use the platform, but these um, I think are being phased out and are quite quite small compared to the cost um, that you would pay for a subscription, for example. And then you have um, the usage based model, which can also be called patron driven acquisition or demand driven acquisition. This is specifically for ebooks. Um, so the way that works is usually you have to create some kind of deposit account. You can say, okay, I'm putting $10,000 in this deposit account. Then the publisher opens up, well, actually the aggregator, this is often done by aggregators. They open access, free access to all the content. And then after a certain amount of usage, it's automatically triggered a purchase. I don't know now what the details of the triggers are, but it used to be something like if somebody prints or copies or views for more than five minutes, for example, click, it's a purchase. And that is then deducted from your deposit. Um, so it depends a little bit on what the trigger is, but also what your budget is and how many books you open up to in the first place. If you have 80,000 books, um, usually there's also ways you can restrict this. So you could say, okay, I only want books that cost less than $100. I only want books from certain publishers that I know. You can cur curate the list. So you, it's not, you're not gonna end up buying books that you don't want that you say, oh, these are bad books, this is bad quality. So there's, there's a lot of control options if you really engage with the different systems that are out there and how you can limit your restrictions, uh, you, the risks that you end up buying something you don't want to buy. I think it's quite a good system. Um, and then the other system that, so usage based, a patron driven acquisition or demand driven, it tends to be offered by aggregators. And the publisher's response to that is something what's called evidence based acquisition, where again, you agree a free upfront um, and that allows unlimited access. Um, and at the end of the year, the institution gets perpetual access to the titles that were most used. Um, and this, again, is um, it's quite a good way because you know that everything you buy has had some usage already. Um, and again, there's ways you can control it um, by limiting in the first place, but it depends really on the provider. So JSTOR is one example. I think Cambridge offers this as well. Um, but that's that's kind of the difference. It tends to be more publishers doing this themselves. Um, what would I say the drawbacks are with evidence-based model? I mean, generally, a subscription, well, subscription is cheaper than purchase, but a lot of times with subscription, you don't get the recent content. So if you want the recent books, if the areas that you want to buy content in, it's important that you have the latest titles. And here we're talking specifically about books, then um, it's important it's important that you have the recent ones, but it's expensive to buy all of them. So then this can be quite a good solution because you can provide access to your users to all the recent books, for example. And like I said, you can filter by specific publishers, specific subjects, and you don't have the problem of buying content that never gets used. It's really just in time rather than just in case, they used to say. Just in case is where you buy books in case somebody needs it. And this is like, okay, all the books are available. And if somebody wants it, they can access it. And if they read it enough, they it, it creates an automatic um, trigger. I think it's quite an attractive model. Um, it doesn't give you the breadth 
and a lot of the vision is sometimes to give you an annual subscription which gives you the breadth of content and then on top of that for really specialized you can purchase individual titles to complete your offering but it really depends it depends on like your users and what what they need um i hope that's answered your question um and then the other model i mentioned here is what i mentioned before already for journals that sometimes now you have this combination of annual subscription with open access publishing fees for authors there's lots more information on the website so i won't go into too much detail um and then we also have different access models um, which i think are less important in some cases they're concurrent user access um, where only one person can access the title at the same time actually you do get that still for ebooks and some databases sometimes um, on textbooks especially but the standard for most of the e-resources outside of textbooks are um, unlimited user access so there's no limit in the number of users that can access an e-resource and the pricing is usually based on the number of full-time students at an institution and I would say this is the norm in most the most cases um, the term FDE comes up quite a lot and usually this means full-time equivalent number of students at an institution um, and some publishers include academic staff um, so it's worth knowing both figures and in specialist resources it can be worth quoting what the FT for a relevant faculty is. So if you license, for example, maths journals, you could quote um, how many people are in the maths department, how many people are studying there. But it's and it's always good to have the official figure. So don't guess, but ask. <laughs> um, so then the next step is arranging a free trial. Um, these can be a really good opportunity to gauge user feedback. Um, usually it's one month sometimes you can ask for more and yeah the really thing i would stress is there's no point in requesting a trial if you're not seriously considering a subscription so that's why i think it's good to know the price in advance to know what you're getting into um it's important to select a good time for trial so not during the holidays not when it's too busy um and avoid having too many trials at once um, you can ask publishers directly for trials, usually there's forms you can fill on on the website and it's important to check statistics. If your decision is based on usage, then you have to make sure you can get statistics. If it's a decision is made by the people that are analyzing the content then and you're not distributing it widely, then it's obviously different. But if you want to make every make students use of the trial, um, that depends a little bit on your policy and if you want to open it up um yeah be aware that a lot of publishers offer trials trial 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 you don't have to try everything that people offer you so although it's nice to try something for free sometimes it can be also confusing for students to have access to something only for one month and then it's gone and then they're like where's it gone it's, you know so think about that to make sure it's really it fits with what you're offering and the solution you're trying to offer um before you announce the trial, make sure the access works and then you can promote it on your website, email, social network, uh, meetings and so on. And any feedback you get, make sure you record it because that will help you make a decision. And then look at usage statistics at the end of the trial. Um, and if your next step then is to consider a subscription, um, your next point would be looking at the license. Um, and this sets out the terms and conditions under which you're allowed to use the content. It usually tells you as well the subscription period, when does it start, when does it finish. Um, it's important to know that for quite a few journal publishers, all the subscriptions go January to December. So even if you start in June, you will pay for the whole year. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, most databases, content, it doesn't really matter, but it's because journals are published during a certain year. So they will charge because you get access to all the new journals from that year. Um, so make sure to check that if you're looking at journals. And the license will also tell you the fee and the payment terms, who can use it, authorized users. 
um, and how the content can be used. And that's obviously very important. We have the IFA model licenses I mentioned earlier that you can check. Um, and we try and keep all those clauses, but sometimes we have to change some of the clauses if publishers um, request this. And this is why we have created this IFA license checklist. Um, and these are also available on the pricing and licensing pages. And it shows if there's any difference from the model license. Um, so I mark it in with a red cross or in yellow. And this is really also quite a nice overview. Even if there are no differences, it's a nice overview of who can use it, what can you do with it? Can you copy and paste? Can you put things in, um, in students' packs and so on? So have a look at that. And it might be an idea to develop this yourself for your users um, to make it clearer because you can't expect users to read the license themselves. Um, and we've created, and this is also something you might want to use it because it's a quite a good overview of what am I allowed to do is this traffic light system. So usually um, download any commercial use is prohibited. Downloading large portions is not allowed um, and displaying parts of it of a database on the public website, sorry, not pubic, public, <laughs> um, is, is not allowed. Um, and then you have the orange, which is ask, um, access for alumni, data mining. Those are things that some publishers say yes, some say no, so better check. And then there's, this is okay, the green light, um, including small abstracts and teaching and learning materials with the citation remote access, access for walk-in users, interlibrary loan. Still, it's good to check the license in case there's differences. Um, maybe IIL should be asked, I'm not sure. <laughs> Things change, but yeah, the, you could develop something like this for your students to make it, to make it clearer for them what they, what they can do and display it and maybe raise awareness, raise awareness um, of issues or just the fact that they can just do what they want with the content. Then signing up to IFIL resources. Um, in most cases, you have to sign a license acceptance form, which just means you're accepting the terms of the license and include all your details. Um, uh, but it's important to read the license carefully and certainly look at the license checklist to see if you any have any questions. Um, and this is really the same also if you get free access. Um, and you should ideally complete these forms in words and then print, scan and sign them and send them to your licensing coordinator in your country, who then forwards it to my colleague Eugenia who will process the form um, and gets in touch with the publisher and then confirms when the access has been opened. And for the paid access, um, a lot of them will end up coming to me and I check them and um, then we pass it on to the publisher and put you in copy and the publisher would then invoice you. So if you have any requests about invoices, it's always good to address those directly to the publisher because I feel it doesn't get involved with invoicing really. Um, and then the next part really, once you've decided to go ahead with your subscription or purchase license um, is to really promote the awareness and use especially if you decided you paid for it you want to make sure people use it so the first thing to do is try it out make sure once you get the link from the publisher you click on the link you download something you do a search you pretend to be somebody looking for something make sure that it works um, and also see if it's easy to use maybe you'll find something interesting and you then talk to your colleague and say, hey, did you look at this new resource? And you can then go and talk to faculty and you have experience yourself. You've tried it out. It's a little bit easier to talk about it. Um, and here's a little tip. Remember one key thing about an e-resource that you can share with colleagues when you bump into them. Yeah, so make it personal so you don't just think about words on the page, but make it specific. Um, and you can then really share the news by informing library staff, subject academic librarians, researchers, um, you can arrange training on how to use the e-resources, share links to videos, um, and include information in any information literacy and research skills training. 
Um, you still sometimes now get plenty of publicity from publishers. If you think that's something that will work, they're usually happy to share um, and, and post things out to you if you ask publishers for posters or mouse mats or leaflets. Um, and it usually doesn't cost anything. You can then put up posters in the library to draw attention to them and you can hand out bookmarks and things at the, at the desk. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is through talking to people, face-to-face -face communication in meetings and library induction sessions for students. Um, and we've got a nice blog here from Amelia, which is a lot about, mentions a lot the importance of talking to people to promote them. Um, but of course, social media is very important and websites. So putting a link on your website, um, if you have purchased ebooks or licensed ebooks, mark records are really important to include them into your library catalog. Uh, you can usually download them for free. Um, and you can also prepare lists of e-resources by title, subject and type and put that on your library web pages to make it easier for people. Um, and here are some other ideas for promoting on faculty web pages, social media, social networking, newsletters, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Email campaigns, if you make it targeted to specific author, specific subject groups. Um, and it's also good, a good idea to include a call to action. So you say, check this resource out, have a look at this. Um, so there's a lot of promotion you can do there that, you know, doesn't cost any money, but it's just repeating things. Um, and here are some important, um, some examples of calls to action. Um, so for example, you could contact head of departments um, and they then cascade information to academic staff, researchers and students. Um, you can contact teaching staff and you say, can you use e-resources to prepare course materials? Can you recommend this resource to students and researchers so they use it so you can contact specific groups and ask them to do um, specific things based on that and of course training is important if you're able to do that arranging training on e-resources um, publishers are usually happy to visit although i have to say i probably need to update this because obviously given coronavirus um, there's less <laughs> in-person visits now but lots of webinars that can be done publishers would be happy to do training webinars um, so we need to update that <laughs> um, and provide support material um, but also if you're doing information literacy training you can include that in in that training And I think this is the last point, um, roughly, about monitoring usage. So obviously, you want to know um, if people are using it. And so one of the things you could look at is number of searches, sessions, downloads for a specific period. Um, you could also drill down usage by title or by collection or for a whole database, which is probably what most people would do. Um, now, it's important to know that each publisher has a different system and it can be quite time consuming. Um, but for the Eiffel licensed resources, we collect usage statistics. I have to say we only do it once a year. So in January, as we start this um, for the previous year. So if you want to check ad hoc, it's really important that you check your own resources. Um, so that's really important. Um, and then there's some information here about counter statistics um, because that's one way to standardize usage statistics. Not all publishers are counter compliant, but most of them are now. So then you can, if you run the same report for different publishers, you can compare, okay, this resource, I get more for my money. Obviously when you compare this, you have to bear in mind the size of the collection. So for example, if Mm, Cambridge journals is 350 journals but Taylor and Francis is 3000 journals so you would expect less journals to have less usage um, this might not be the case but there's something to bear in, why, in mind when you compare them you can't always just compare them based on those numbers um, and also when you look at subject areas um, you want to make sure if like a journal collection is very focused on one subject um, you might not get as much usage as something that's multidisciplinary 
Um, so again, that's something to bear in mind. But it's really important to check this, especially for paid resources, because then you can look at price per download, for example, is one of the metrics that will help you assess um, what the value is. So if you get a very low price per download, it's really good value. And if it's very high, you can maybe it's a red flag and you want to look at if you want to renew it or not um, and benchmark um, against that. The other thing that's important is feedback from users. So statistics are numbers, but they don't tell the whole story. So there could be some quite expensive, very specific content that's very, very useful to some people. Um, so sometimes it's not just about quantity, but if it's specialist, it's about quality. So please make sure you ask for feedback on a regular basis. Um, then if you're thinking about renewing agreements, you have to make sure you do this um, in good time. It is usually a few months before the end of the current agreement. And this is where usage statistics can be really helpful because they can help you make a decision about whether you want to renew or not or any red flags. Um, but it's also good practice to check usage, let's say halfway through the year or every three months to make sure there's good usage and you don't then panic <laughs> near the end of the renewal and you think nobody used this. Uh, maybe I didn't promote it enough. So I think the two go hand in hand. Um, you should also see if you're doing promotion and you can see the effect, oh, this promotion has led to a rise in usage, um, then it's a good motivator to keep promoting the resources because you know it will drive usage, which is ultimately what you want. Um, and here's like, because we talked a little bit about consortia in terms of the negotiating, obviously consortia also play an important role in providing the whole, the rest of the process that we've covered. So consortia should provide institutions uh, with information about the resources. So remind them about the URLs for accessing, about the content, send the title lists, but also provide support about other things like how to find mark records, Ex explaining about how to get usage statistics, um, help them do the analysis on whether a subscription is cost effective or not, help run webinars, for example, training. If it's a consortial subscription, you could run trainings like a webinar for all the members, not just for one institution. Um, and once publishers are back to visiting, you could get a publisher to visit and run a training, for example, for a set of librarians from 10 different institutions and these librarians then go and train the users so you could cascade it down in that way um, that's pretty much everything from the licensing i'm quite pleased we managed to get through that i know it's nearly time um, so these are just a few slides on open access content obviously you don't need to license open access content because it's completely open completely free but it's still a good way um, to find content, to identify content, and you can still promote it. So um, I've put in some examples from DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, where you can search and you can also filter by um, subject areas to find relevant content. Um, and the same goes for DOAB, the Directory of Open Access Books, where you can uh, browse by subject um, and find relevant titles and um, you can also get the mark records for your library catalog, I believe. Um, and lastly, I just want to point you towards this little flyer that we created, which can be useful for researchers and how to get access to the article you need um, with different tips and clickable links. Um, so that's also on the Eiffel resources sections, which can be useful if you don't license the sources, but you want to provide access to content um, free of charge. Um, and that's everything. I hope that wasn't too quickly. I um, feel like I was rushing through a little bit. Um, I will stop sharing so I can see if there's any, um, about 45 people, that's great. Um, more than when I started. <laughs> Um, I don't see any questions, but if you have questions, I'm still, I'm still here. Um, I maybe stop the recording just now.